Welcome to Review Chat, a monthly discussion about business, marketing, and science behind online reviews. This chat is sponsored by the Review Society, an association dedicated to the business and science of customer reviews. So if you want to join the Review Society, please click that little call to action button in green at the bottom of your screen on Crowdcast. And if you are watching on Facebook or one of the other wonderful channels where you're seeing us live right now, then please go ahead and visit ReviewSociety.org. And I will also uh, share that URL with you at the end of the broadcast as well. But I am the host of Review Chat, Hello. Kiki Latalian. And for this show, I'm talking with Gavin Mullins. Uh, he's the CEO of a company that captures and helps promote in-person real-time reviews. And Ben Martin, Executive Director of the Review Society. Welcome, everyone. It's uh, always good. Okay, fantastic. So, Gavin, in preparation for this show, I actually read a piece you wrote, uh, found it online. I love it. Googled you, Googled Googled a little bit about you and found this wonderful review, not review, wonderful article called Negative Customer Reviews Are Not the End of the World. And in it, you talk about how research is showing how trust in business has reached an all-time low. You wrote, we're living in an era characterized by mis- trust and consumers have become very cynical and then went on to talk about the power of user generated content in the form of what we're talking about today which is reviews. Yeah. So now your business actually focuses on capturing these reviews. It's interesting because you're collecting reviews from customers in action, people who are actually in the process of experiencing a service or product. I have so many questions for you today but first can you talk to me a little bit about the psychology of collecting reviews in person? How is it different from collecting them by email or postcard or phone? Well, today the majority of review platforms want their business users to direct their customers to their website. So what's happening, we find during our research last year, was that businesses asking for reviews uh, via email or by post or whatever, we're actually only getting about 20 to 30 percent of a success rate out of every 10 they ask. So they're getting roughly a two in 10 success rate. Hmm. And it was mainly because people are consumers are people and they're busy and they have their own lives. And when you have to ask them to do something at a later date, they simply forget or are just too busy to do so. And this is what we found. And this is how the Euro was born. We wanted to bring something to market. It enabled the business owner to be able to capture the review right there and right then as they deliver the product or service. And that's either in store or out on site, on location, whatever. We wanted something that was there in their hand. Everybody carries a smartphone these days. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a smartphone or a tablet at their side for work. And what better way to, to capture reviews than to have a simple app that you can present to your customer who's just received, hopefully, a product or service from your business. And that's the opportune time to request that review. Instead of leaving, walking away and emailing them a week or so later or a few days later and then not getting the review, you've got the chance. The customer's happy with your service and it's the opportune time to capture that review. I mean, when I, when I think about that, when I think about somebody being right there and actually capturing the review, I think about um, like when you go to a conference and all the time after each session, you know, you'll either end up with the little review sheet in front of you or you'll end up in, with the app where you're supposed to fill out the review. And I would say probably half to 75% of the people don't actually uh, fill them out. If they fill them out, they kind of partially fill them out. They're kind of hurried through it. And I think the interesting thing is for somebody to, to capture that in that moment and probably like verbally or vocally, something like that, where somebody else is able to capture that. You're talking to another human being. Um, I think that that is kind of interesting because I think that the results that you get would be different. So can you talk well, to me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we know from our early beta testers last year that using our system 
as opposed to using the email based review request systems that you can collect four to five hundred percent more reviews wow so of, yeah it's, it's very simple i mean it's it's uh, we'll go into the human nature side of reviews afterwards but if you're only collecting two and ten reviews from an email based or or postal based request system then by by collecting those reviews face to face it's in, it's in human nature not to be able to say no to somebody that's just provided you with a good product or service it's the right time to ask and, and i know of our beta testers that they were only getting two and ten one and ten results and as soon as they start using our app and now they, this was a business in particular that was store based and site based they were a flooring installation contractor and all their fitting teams had the app on their phone. Their shop sales teams had the app on their phone. And every time there was an opportunity to capture the customer review. And they went from getting two out of 10 requests to getting eight, nine, and some and 10 out of 10 requests. It really maximized their return. It's really helped boost their business because they've got more review more often and convert more customers by by presenting their previous customer satisfaction. Yeah. And yeah. Really I can even, yeah, I mean, I can, I can even reflect on some of our experiences gathering reviews for the, the platforms that we've run and, you know, going back to our, our first guest on review chat, uh, Terry <laughs> Carden, who started uh, review my AMS, um, you know, in the early days, uh, she was just banging the pavement, basically walking around trade shows, trying to get people to give reviews on their association management system, which is Review My AMS, the site that she runs. Um, and, and in my experience running review sites of my own, when you're face to face with somebody and, and asking basically like for a personal favor to give a review, I think Gavin's point of, of driving four to five hundred percent more reviews because you're doing it in person is, is spot on. I think there's um, like this halo effect where you know if you and I are standing face to face, or um, another way that's been pretty effective for us as well is to say, "Hey, um, can you join me on a screen share? I want to watch you get a review on my review platform." The number of reviews that we're able to su successfully get as a percentage is a lot higher when there's that face to face or kind of real time interaction. Uh, so that's really what what drew me uh, to Gavin's company in the first place was like, "Oh, this he's definitely capitalizing on kind of that social psychology." Um, and you know, basically, the ability to, to get a favor when you're talking to somebody face to face or in real time. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so cool because for people to say no to somebody that's just right done there. Good for them. Wow. Uh, yeah. you, you, can't, you can't say no to that. It's a, so you're yeah. going to take thirty seconds out of your time and you're going to write a quick, quick review on an app. It's, it's, so it's I want to bring up. To do in that day. Um, I want to bring up. Oh. <laughs> okay, so and we're hearing that there's a little bit. Uh, it's Hassan is saying it's it's hard to hear Gavin. Sorry about that, guys. So that's the thing is you know we bring in some experts and sometimes these guys are world travelers and they're going all over the place and sometimes the the connection isn't the best, but. But um, I am confident that we're going to be uh, continuing to get some really good uh, information coming from, from Gavin. I'm crossing my fingers that, that the connection is going to improve as we go along. Uh, some comments that are coming in, I want to just, this is the benefit of being able to do these things live. Uh, Tom says, you know, that's always my concern moment many want to send a review is when they're upset. So he's talking about, yeah, a lot of people are doing, you know, they're wanting to do these reviews when when they're upset. So what does that mean? You know, and and uh, Russ is saying something similar. He's saying that that's interesting, Ben. I would think that people would tend to flame out on an app or electronically versus in person. I would think they would be nicer in person. And so, and then Hasana yeah. had brought up a, a really interesting question. She said, what about talk, uh, tracking the NPS or the net promoter score real time so you can address bad reviews immediately? And that's a really interesting question. So, you know, maybe while Gavin yeah. reconnects, Ben, would you like to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, I, I, I chatted back to Tom already mm -hmm. about, um, you know, this whole notion of getting reviews in the moment that the person has received the service or the product. And I definitely, I, there, there is definitely like some social pressure that when you're giving a review in the moment, um, it's, it's, 
the person is more inclined to give a positive review when you're face to face. And I, I mentioned this earlier, it's like the halo effect. It's like, if you're, you know, Kiki, you asked me for a favor, or you asked me for some input, you know, when we're face to face, it's a lot easier for me to say something really, really nice about you than if I'm doing it like in a, in a, in another room, which of course I would never, do <laughs> but, <laughs> but this, this notion that when, when people, when we're face to face with somebody else who's asking for that mm -hmm. review, um, our inclination, I think is, is there's really two, there's two aspects here. One is we're more likely to actually deliver on the review at that moment in time because there's that pressure that, hey, we're here right now together. Do me a favor. Um, but then also there's that the social pressure of, oh, this person's right here face to face with me. Um, there's their social pressure then to, to give a, po or a more positive review. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think to Gavin's point um, right before that is that the moment that we are actually consuming that service, we're in a we're in a place where we're more likely to get because maybe we haven't had a chance to digest everything else that goes along with, with that. So like, Oh, you know, maybe a couple of days down the road, I have a problem with the, with the product or the service at that point in time, I'm probably more likely to give a negative review. Yeah. Um, but the moment that it's handed over, there's that euphoria of like, okay, my need, my need has been met. Now I want to give my review. Um, I, I thought another interesting point uh, with Hasana's around uh, managing net promoter score in real time. And Kiki, you actually posted something into the Review Society uh, on this, which is the um, happy or not. Yeah. Um, maybe we can put in a, a link. I, I'll, I'll grab the link uh, back over to you. But um, happy or not is basically like it's a physical piece of equipment that you put in a store, you could even in a, well, I've seen them, they're in the restrooms uh, here in Nashville at the airport. So when you leave the restroom, you hit one of four buttons on this little device and it will instantly tell the airport if you are satisfied or not with your experience in the restroom. And if the restroom needs attention, they're gonna get a message that says, oh, somebody just hit the, the, the in the bathroom uh, in concourse C at gate 21. And they'll send somebody out there to to look into it. Um, so, like managing reviews in real time, um, a, a spin on what we're talking about here with Gavin. Um, and like, there are ways, even with you know, with this uh, happy or not, to um, to evaluate in real time how your your company or your product or your service is doing. Oh, and I see. I'm hearing Gavin, and I'm seeing I that, Gavin. Guys. Okay. Um, and Russ says something. Okay, yes. Um, Russ Sorry, is saying. Very bad arms. West Coast of Ireland. I apologize. That's okay. I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Can you hear me? Okay, Gavin. Yes, I can hear you fine. The picture is really good. No problem. All right. Excellent. Russ made a, a comment, Ben, about they have those in Montgomery County, uh, Maryland liquor stores. Not that I would know that firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so, you know, one of the other interesting things about this is, uh, you know, to Tom's point earlier about giving a negative review. Um, I've been reading some research recently that says that the easier that it is to give a review, the more likely that you are to get a positive review. So to Tom's point, mm -hmm. if I'm really hacked off, um, and this review form is very difficult to complete. Like that's the only way you're going to get a review from me. Like if I'm happy, I don't want to jump through a bunch of hoops to give a review. Yeah. However, if I'm hacked off, you bet I'm going to go through. You know, I'll do a double opt in, and I'll I'll complete 14 pages of of information. I'll give you some personal uh, details on myself. Like I can give you a whole lot of stuff, but you know, so, but to Tom's point. Um, may have nothing to do specifically with Gavin's company, but the easier it is to give a review, the more likely you are to get positive reviews. Um, because again, th this notion that if I'm mad, I'm more willing to give a review. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When it's easy to give a review, you know, it's then uh, you're more, po you're more likely to get positive reviews. That's the research that I'm reading. Yeah. You know, when I went to renew my passport last year, they had the the buttons there uh, that went from frowny face to happy face. And uh, I thought that that was really interesting. I would I would be curious to see what kind of net promoter score uh, those folks have. But um, but, you know, it's and I wish I wish Gavin were. Oh, maybe he's here. Maybe I wished him back into existence. Yes. Back. Back. <laughs> yes. So, sorry, um, so sorry. 
No, that's okay. I'm so glad that you're here. So I wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit more about your business, especially while you're here. Um, sure, that's right. Yes. And so I wanted to find out, so who, who is your ideal client? How does your business work? What does that look like? Our ideal client is any small business with between one and five employees. Mm -hmm. um, anybody from dentists, practitioners, from plumbers to electricians, from heating engineers to opticians. Business, small business who we designed in your mind want to provide a service that's very affordable for them and very easy to use and one that really works for them. But we, we, we really typically want SMEs or SMBs. That's, that's what we are focused on always. And so when someone hires you, what is, so um, do you send people out and they collect the, inter the interviews, the reviews from uh, people in the process? Walk, walk me through what that kind of, uh, what that looks like. Uh, what, what happens with the Euro, a business comes along, they sign up, they download our app to their device and up to five employees' devices. So they get the whole team involved with collecting the business. They install a little web on their own site. It will automatically display the six most recent reviews they've collected. They can also link their Euro account with their Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, and LinkedIn accounts. And to review, it will automatically get posted on networks. But once huh. they actually set up their Euro account, thing a business needs to do is collect reviews. They've got to feed the review base, keep reviews coming, and we'll keep pumping them out. We'll display them on their website automatically, and we'll push it out to their social media now. So once it's set, nothing else to do, unless they get a negative. Oh, we lost them. Um, what? <laughs> unless they what? And I'm on the edge of my seat to find no. out. No. <laughs> So, so my next question for Gavin, actually, this is a question for uh, you too, Ben, is, is really when you are putting these things together, when you have these ways of collecting reviews, how can you ensure or better ensure that you're going to get quality reviews? Are there ways that you can put the questions together so that you're getting, um, you know, reviews that are meaningful and not just something that you know, does it really help anybody? And over, by the way, anybody who's listening to this later or anyone who's watching um, on other channels right now, there's this really great discussion and questions going on in the chat box here where it's saying, well, so how advanced should it be? Is it enough for you to have a, a sad face and a happy face? Or do you need to have a more extensive range or a way to, to bring in quality reviews? And the answer back was saying, um, well, it depends. You know, it depends on the product and what kind of information you are looking for. Um, and Hasana says, an example is when you rate your experience on Uber. Uh, and I never know how to say this. So is it Kava? Is that how you actually say the the name of the the uh <laughs> yes, okay, good. Uh -huh. I've eaten there. I just never knew how to how to say it. On the on the app on the app and it's bad, you can rate your experience in a one to five rating. If you rate it poorly, they immediately investigate the situation and rectify it with a free ride or meal in these examples. It happened to me at Kava and I got a free meal from a bad rating I gave them. This allows companies to track the net promoter score real time after a transaction, like Ben said. And that's so fantastic that real time you're able to actually impact change, affect change. Yep. Well, it, it also kind of, it, it goes to this whole notion of the, the happy or not, where, you know, if, if the restaurant needs attention in real time, it needs attention in real time. And you can actually get that data from that, that app, which I think is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to, to, to Hassan's point, um, you know, being able to reply quickly to any kind of disruption in service or any kind of dissatisfaction is, is critical. Like I see this a lot with Lyft. Um, you know, Lyft, oh, my driver took a circuitous route to get to where I needed to go. And, oh, my God, it cost me an extra three. Yeah. If I complain about it, Lyft will actually write, write to me back and say, oh, well, you know, uh, we're sorry for your, um, for, for, for your uh, substandard ride. Um, here's a, a $5 credit for your next ride. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, the ability to, to take what could be 
negative interaction and turn it into something that went to back. But I mean, Lyft, for example, you know, I've had hundreds of positive experiences. Even one little negative experience like that is not likely to change my mind about using Lyft. But the ability for them to back to happiness when maybe I've had a, a dissatisfied experience is is a good, it's a good uh, approach, a good strategy. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think that for a lot of organizations, they're scared to do some of the things, some of the, some of the features that Gavin was talking about, being able to automatically push the most recent reviews out and that sort of thing um, would make me nervous, you know, having a business. And I'm sure it makes a lot of them uh, nervous, but yeah. it also puts them, you know, talk about transparency. It puts them right there on the cutting edge where they are able, as Hasana was talking about with her example with Kava, they are able to respond immediately and, and take care of a problem. And so, yeah. I mean, what do you say about um, people who are maybe businesses, organizations that are maybe afraid of publicizing or sharing some of these reviews? I mean, mm -hmm. how is it a good idea to explore more? Does it depend on the organization or the service or the product? What say you, Ben Martin? Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, and I've been having this debate with um, some other review geeks out there recently. Um, so I hope uh, in the future I want to have on uh, Review Chat uh, somebody who's been involved in uh, reviews for realtors and real estate agents uh, for the better part of the last 20 years. Uh, and we were talking uh, this past week about this whole notion of an evaluation versus a, a review. So the way that I think about evaluations are like, if I go to a conference, um, the association is gonna give me an evaluation. I'm gonna fill out all of these fields and give you my experience on that. Um, but that evaluation is never really gonna see the light of day. It's mm -hmm. always gonna be held behind the scenes. And while the association or the whoever the event organizer is, they might cherry pick a few quotes to put out there as like testimonials. So the, for the most part, none of that um, information is gonna see the light of day. Mm -hmm. A review, on the other hand, is, if, in, my, in my view, intended to be publicly displayed. So you know, with, um, with the Happy or Not app, the little four, four talking about, like that's, that's more of an evaluation. Those mm -hmm. reviews, that kind of stuff doesn't really make its way out to the light of day. A review, on the other hand, is kind of more intended to be, I take in the review and everything that I get is, is published and it's out there. Um, and again, airing your laundry like that, it can be pretty scary for yeah. organizations. And I, so I think it just, it takes a bold type of company to embrace that, that kind of transparency and say, you know what, we own our reviews, good, bad, or, or whatever. Like we own these reviews and we're going to put them out there. And I think, you know, maybe a, a twist on this while we've got Gavin back for a moment yeah. is, you know, what's, um, I'd be curious on Gavin's take, like, when I get reviews and they appear on Yelp, which is like a third party um, review platform, um, reviews that are gathered through his company mm -hmm. that appear on my website. Like, I wonder how, how do consumers do those two different types of reviews? Those that are hosted on my, clearly I've got some control over these. Um, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, Yelp, um, I, this, is, this is a third party platform. I'd be kind of curious. Gavin, if you have a take on how do customers perceive reviews on one versus the other? Well, um, you know, I think what you're talking about is uh, businesses that develop their own testimonials and feedback in themselves, yes? Is that correct? Well, not only that, but um, through your platform, as I understand it, you can place a widget on your website that that displays. I think you said last six reviews. Mm -hmm. um, is there any is there any difference in consumers in your experience on the perception review that's posted and and really hosted by the business owner as opposed to those that are hosted by, say, a Yelp or an Angie's List or TripAdvisor? Oh, no, no, <laughs> yet again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to hit. The, I want to hit the frowny face on the storms. I right know now, but, Ireland exactly storms. I know. <laughs> so um, while we are waiting for Gavin to come back, uh, and I see him, uh, like it's so weird because I can. I have several monitors here, so I can see different versions of what's happening right now, um, live for me 
and, you know, live for other people watching on like Facebook. It's uh, fascinating stuff. But we have a couple of questions and I want to go into that because I know for a fact, one of them is sort of, um, we're dreaming into the future. And one of them is actually talking about uh, how you can prevent fake reviews. That's the one that I really want to jump into first. And then we're going to talk about Tom's looking at ways to maybe explore an opportunity that exists. Yeah. But so Hasana says, do you have someone, do you have to have someone monitor, for example, how can you prevent fake reviews? And I think that that's a really important question, especially in this day and age of fake news and like trying to make sure validate that something is actually real, you know, yep. and authentic. And I know that you have an answer for that, Ben, because we've talked about this before. So uh, yeah. why don't you go into that? Yeah. And this would be another uh, topic for a, a full review chat. We could we can yeah. go into, into a lot of detail around this. So, uh, but yeah, I love how you say fake news, fake reviews. Um, yeah. We're, you know, the review society, um, one of the things that we're, we're taking up is this whole mantle of the notion of um, ensuring that the reviews that are given um, and those who are running review sites know how to spot fake reviews. Mm -hmm. um, but this is becoming a, a huge challenge. So let's just let's go through a couple of stats here. Uh, the first one is that uh, it's estimated that up to 20 percent of all reviews on Yelp are fake. Um, wow. So like one out of five reviews already are fake. Um, Another interesting fact is that uh, the University of Chicago ran a study last year uh, where they actually built artificial intelligence to write fake reviews. Um, and so basically they had these neural networks, these computers, these, this AI writing fake reviews, and they actually used to a test with real life human beings, just like you and me, Kiki. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that more times than not, humans thought that the fake reviews that were written by AI were legitimate reviews. So they, <laughs> they, they actually had a harder time. Um, they, the people who, who were viewed as less authentic than the fake reviews that were written by AI. So then that kind of begs the point, well, wait a minute. If, if, a, if a human being can't filter out the fake reviews, like Hassan has questioned, how, how much good would a real life human being be at trying to filter out the fake reviews? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess this list lends some credence to the notion that Yelp is actually deploying its own AI, its own mm -hmm. algorithms to try to flag the fake reviews because if a human <laughs> sucks at doing it, yeah. why would we even employ somebody to do that? Um, yeah. So I can, I can kind of speak to what, um, what we've seen. Um, w one thing that we do, uh, We run it, and in full disclosure, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I do serve as executive director of the the Review Society. I also have a software platform uh, that allows uh, uh, organizations to set up their own B two B review sites. Uh, one of the things that we try to sniff out fake reviews before they ever make it onto a site um, is to ask for a person's employer email address, um, and like just by getting an employer's email address, you can track the person down on LinkedIn. You could go to the company's website and look for their information. Um, on that website, some contact details for that person. Um, if there's any question about the legitimacy of the review, you can always write to the person and ask them to clarify. Maybe um, if I'm feeling extra suspicious about this review, I might ask for an invoice or might ask for a screenshot of them logged in to the software that they're reviewing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so spending a lot of time trying to vet the identity of the person before the review even comes into the platform at all is one of the best practices that we follow with the with the software that, that we've developed. Um, but further to that, um, we don't allow any review to go up on a platform that we, um, uh, that my partners and I are, are running without them being reviewed by by a person, fully knowing that hey, if this if this is a, an AI generated fake review and they've gone somebody's gone through the process of registering. Um, a, a .com email address that looks like an employer and setting up a LinkedIn account. Like if they've gone through all those hoops, then, whew, you know, that's good. That's tough for us to try to figure out. But, um, you know, I think w we just have to acknowledge that there's, there's a certain amount of uncertainty in reviews that, you know, as much as we trust reviews, I think we always have to just view them as another point of reference 
as we're considering making a buying decision, like in the same way that a reference client is a, as a reference point or a, a source of data, the company's website uh, is a point of input for that decision. Uh, the cost, and all of these things, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of uncertainty in all of them. And, and the whole notion is that you're not going to rely 100% on reviews on, on whether or not to make a buying decision. It might be an important part of it, but it shouldn't be the end all be all. Right. And, you know, further on that, so on the subject of uh, talking about potentially fake reviews, uh, there were a couple of questions. What about anonymous reviews? Should those be allowed? And Tom asks, is there liability on the reviewer for posting a fake review? You know, yeah. if it's negative. Oh, yeah. So there's absolutely uh, repercussions for writing yeah. a fake review, especially if it is uh, libelous, slanderous, you know, in any way objectionable like that. Um, but yeah, so as a matter of fact, uh, writing fake reviews is basically illegal uh, under uh, Federal Trade Commission rules um, here in the U.S. anyway. Um, as a matter of fact, um, you know, it, it, it's actually punishable by a fine or even imprisonment. Um, so yeah, giving, giving a fake review is basically a violation mm. of the law, at least here in the United States. Um, so, the, you know, this whole... Um, uh, notion of uh, of anonymous reviews. Um, there's kind of two two sides to that coin as well. Um, in an anonymous review, you're more likely to be very mm -hmm. open and honest about your experience, uh, because if the that review can't be tied back to you as a person, then the vendor can't come back to you and say, "Hey, wait a minute, why did you give this negative review?" So, uh, the example I would give is, let's just say I'm using a big piece of enterprise software, and I'm I give a bad review, and then suddenly I've got my account rep calling me up and like harassing me and saying, hey, come on, why did you give us the bad review? What can we do to fix it? And, you know, as a customer, I don't really, I don't want that attention and I don't want that, um, that extra, you know, phone call. Um, but on the flip side, when as a consumer, you're reading a review and somebody's identity is tied to it, that review is viewed as more authentic and believable because mm -hmm. again, you've attached your real name to it. So like you might notice in, in Amazon, there are these things like, real name and uh, uh, authenticated person, yeah, verified person, yeah. something like that, yeah. Um, verified so, or, you know, yeah. Being able yeah. to, as a consumer, yeah. reading reviews with a real name tied to them is, makes the review more believable. However, from the reviewer's point of view, if I can have some anonymity, mm -hmm. I'm more likely to speak more freely about my experience because I perceive that there will be fewer or no repercussions to me when my review is not linked strictly to my name. All right, so how about this? Riddle me this, Ben Martin. Okay, so uh, Tom, and, and I'm so glad that you're, you're watching today, Tom, and participating. He always has some thought-provoking questions to ask. All of our wonderful viewers do, but... Um, but Tom asks, uh, associations are challenged with their members reviewing their supplier members. How can we turn that into an opportunity? So I'm not I quite like sure I'm following question. the question. <laughs> so um, how can we turn that into an opportunity for uh, the okay. uh, yep. associations, okay. Tom? That's what I, how I'm reading it. Oh, and... Jed says, I'm leaving a good review for review chat today. Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I'm so glad you're here too. Oh my gosh, you know, I'm stalking Jed. I'm actually trying to get him to come on to uh, the chat sometime. So the chat, I'm just saying yeah. the chat because it could be association chat. Or so chat. Uh, this know. question of associations. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, clearly, Kiki, you and yes. I have been in, Let's in talk the association. About it way too long now, I guess. <laughs> Time to retire, I wish. <laughs> um, Just long enough. So, Just long enough, yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things that we've we found, and, and this goes back to our last uh, review chat, actually, with uh, Drs. Uh, Naris and Stewart, um, is this notion that um, members of associations are already turning to their fellow members for ratings and reviews on the products and services that they use at work. Um, they do this by way of going to conferences where like, if I'm getting ready to buy something, I'm going to go to a conference, I'm going to visit vendors, but I also want to talk to people who have either just gone through the buying process, or I want to commiserate with people who are going through the process with me right now. 
The other way that uh, members connect with each other around reviews is that they go to their online communities that they belong to. Uh, these online communities could be um, on LinkedIn or they could be private online communities. But the research that we've seen from doctors Newer, uh, Stewart and Naris uh, basically says that uh, buyers yeah. like to go to these online communities to ask for recommendations and re reviews from their fellow members. Um, you know, the, the notion that, uh, that Terry and I have been working on is that, you know, instead of just posting that question out into uh, cyberspace on, on a review, on an on a online community, for example, what if we could get some objectivity and some more organization and some more context around those reviews and let all of those reviews kind of get aggregated and bubbled up into a way that it makes it easier for a buyer to look at those reviews and say, ah, okay, I see now that 82% of uh, buyers would recommend this product. Further to that, they get a four out of five on customer service. They get a five and a, they get five out of five on innovation. Um, and they can have like a, a lots of different like star ratings and even a narrative review and then some more context around, well, this person works for a big organization, but I work for a small one. Is their review as relevant to me? Being that I work for a small organization, this review came from a big organization and really providing some more context around the review. Um, so, you know, I think associations are in, a, in a, uh, like in the, being able to provide to their members um, some organization around and of the reviews and recommendations that come in in such a way that would inform a smarter buying decision for their for their members. I mean, we can we can throw trade show booths and advertising at them all day long, but when it comes time to actually make mm -hmm. a good, smart, informed buying decision, how much do I trust yeah. that advertisement? How much do I trust that trade show booth? How much do I trust that sales rep? Uh, it's really the opinions of my fellow members, my fellow buyers, um, that really, uh, am, the, if, you, if you read the research and you believe the research, you know, those peer, peer reviews, those peer opinions are the most informative um, factors to take in, in, into consideration. One thing that Gavin, and Gavin says uh, in the chat box, guys, he said, really sorry, guy, connection here is terrible tonight. And I know he's so great. I love talking with him. Um, but I have to say, thanks to technology, we have Tom Morrison here who he's asking this, this mysterious question about uh, finding opportunity and the fact that associations uh, have members who are reviewing some of their other members. So let's talk about that. I brought I brought Tom on so that we could just ask him, what are you talking about? But, what, so I'm, what's so I'm glad I did my hair today. <laughs> I know, me too. Me too. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> if, if we're going to bring the review process into an association, I mean, the predominant people we probably would like to review would be the supplier side, because that's who I was doing business with our members. But the moment you go out to your suppliers and they go, oh my gosh, that association we give, 10 grand to every year is about to put us out in the open space to be transparent mm. with our service. Now, and, mm. and uh, think about when social media came in 2007, 8, and 9, when private social media networks began to really hit stride with member fuse, higher logic. The first thing every association was saying was stand up and say, so what if someone posts something bad about us in the, in the site? And my common yeah. response was, well, if you have a lot more bad than good, you got a problem. And wouldn't you like to know that out in the open and them telling people at a conference at a cocktail party in the back somewhere where you never get to hear it? So I think what we're wrestling with is just how do we how do we implement that review process in a positive way that I mean, I think Terry Cardin's done a phenomenal job at getting AMS companies to see the value and benefit of all of a sudden being very transparent. It actually keeps them on the top of their game because if you mess up, well, guess what? Somebody's going to say something about it in the open mm -hmm. space. So it's making that's why my question was, how do you make that leap? So that, you know, five, three years from now, the associates are looking back going, wow, we want to sponsor that review site because one, it's getting a lot of hits. It's credible. And as long as we keep our end of the bargain and serve our customers right, all we get is we get hiccups in the road, but we don't get things online that like cause us to lose business. But that's mm -hmm. a huge struggle, I think, for the association side is how do you get how do you tell that story so you can make the leap and not have someone say, you know what, we're just going to take our 20 grand and go home because you are putting us out on the street. But. Do you really want that kind of a member, though, is what I'd ask as well. So I think there's lots mm -hmm. of things going around that I think that's why I say there's opportunity there. Mm -hmm. But how do you bridge that into where five years from now you go, we made a great decision. Hmm. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's, it's what, what we're finding with, with the platform that we've developed again, and I'm, I'm here for the review society not to talk about 100 reviews, but uh, talking with associations and uh, trying to get them to, to understand this notion of, of reviews, um, how members should, should have the ability to rate and review the stuff that they use at work, because those reviews are very difficult to find. Um, and really what association exists to do for most professions and most industries is to help those professionals do their jobs better. And one of the most critical things that any professional does is make good, informed, smart buying decisions on behalf of their company. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've I've made some bad purchasing decisions in my life, and I can't say that it's ever gotten me fired. But I know people who have been fired over making a I almost used a four letter word. Making a bad <laughs> buying decision, <laughs> Make a, a bad buying decision, and so you know, as, as associations, if we were really truly devoted to helping our members do their jobs better, it's not just about increasing your proficiency in the the profession or the industry that you're working in. It's also helping you to make informed buying decisions. And by the way, right, for a lot of association people making good informed buying decisions is a core part of their responsibility. And so, yeah. you know, we just, and, and again, going back to uh, Stuart and Naris and, and their, their research, um, people already turn to the professional societies and trade associations when they're looking for these reviews. So in our view, why not associations take up the mantle of what your members are already do. And instead of just being a kind of a passive um, entity, really assert yourselves associations and say, look, we're not just going to throw trade show booths and advertising at you member. We're also going to help you tap into the hive mind of your fellow members and basically say, this is what your fellow members say about these products and services. Yeah. And you're getting ready to make a purchasing decision. Isn't this the kind of information that you're looking for? Right. It's a, I think it, it see it acts like a, a great checks and balances in my mind. I mean, I, I feel like having that there, um, it, it allows the association to provide an additional benefit and really a, an additional value that wouldn't other otherwise be there. Or if it were there, it would be through something like online communities or something like that, which you have to search and dig and like try to compile stuff over time. And so I, I think that being able to offer this, this ability to provide reviews is probably, you know, something that is, is worth the fear and worth maybe pushing yeah. through the fear if you can do it right, you know? Well, if I can say something on that, Kiki, I, I think it's a huge deal from an association because as you are talking, I'm thinking through, I mean, if, if you're a company that is doing it right, you can tell companies that if they're not doing it right, and they know they're not doing it right, they're not going to want to be reviewed. So it tells you about the company. If you're a company that's really doing it right, you're going to want to be reviewed. And so I think of the big picture, if you could rate any company on product, uh, um, delivery, um, customer experience, and their people enthusiasm, just, uh, just on those four things, it would tell you so much if you want to do business with that company. Hmm. And I think about our, our association, you know, if it's an, also an interconnector and engagement because if you're if my members are going to do business with somebody, they're probably going to look to our associates first because they actually can get reviews as opposed to looking outside the association supplier. So it's a huge benefit to be in the loop and be a member of the association. Why? Because you get reviewed by hundreds of people doing business in the sector. And I'm going to probably choose them before I'm going to choose someone outside the membership. Why? Because they're not reviewed. I know nothing about them. So it cuts. A, it makes the buying decision, very the buying research decision, very efficient for the customer. I agree. I agree. So Gavin says here, a perfect review score is not a good indicator for a business. No one's perfect and consumers know this. So, and that's something that I feel like with the review chats, that's something that keeps coming up with people who are saying, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't pass the sniff test, you know, like, you know, you just know when you go on Amazon or just anywhere where you're looking at reviews, Yelp or something, you just know if it's just sort of this generic, it's great, it's the best, it's whatever, and it's over and over, and there's like 150 of them. You just know it doesn't, it's probably not valid because if somebody loves something that much, especially a lot of people, they're probably going to go into it more. Just the yeah. same. If they hate it a whole lot, they're probably going to go into it more. And I, I 
I know in, um, you know, from reading different things about how you should think about your own reviews or people who are reviewing your own services or products, that you should always look, if you can, for sort of the middle row, the middle of the road, because you can see areas for growth and you can also see what you're getting right. Because usually if it's too good, you know, it's somebody who's too much of a fan and you can't really grow as much from it. And if it's too bad, it's it's also somebody just might have a thorn in their side. So, yeah. So I have a question for Ben. Yeah, go for it. You can ask so, it. So, so uh, Gavin, Gavin just said a four out, 4.9 out of 5 is better than a 5 out of 5. So huh. what I see a lot of times on when, I'm, when we get our surveys from hotels when we do our conferences is they ask you to rate and it says if it's not a 5.0, then tell us why. And knowing that if you're a 4.8, I mean, I rate four, I think if you get a 4.5 or better, there's really no need to discuss. I typically sometimes don't ever rate a 5.0 because there's always room for improvement. But I think, how much should we pay attention to the question? If it's not a 5.0, then tell us why. I mean, mm -hmm. it yeah. could be, it, are you chasing yeah. something that you really can't fix? Yeah, also, I mean, Gavin is, is spot on and so are you, Tom. Um, and there was, a, there was a, a study that I saw come out uh, last week or maybe earlier this week um, that said that in the eyes of a, uh, somebody who's reading reviews, a four-star review is the most trusted. Not mm -hmm. five, not three. It's a four-star review. Um, and so, you know, this notion of, of having to chase five-star reviews, I think, is really misguided because a cu mm -hmm. customer doesn't believe it anyway. Uh, I think all of this goes back to, I think, kind of the early days of reviews and some of those, these reputation management companies that are out there. And, I, you know, I have no, I have no beef with any of them. But there was research that was put out that said for every one star increase in your rating on Yelp, uh, businesses would earn an extra like nine to eleven percent in revenue. And this notion of chasing after the fifth star so that I can bump my revenue another nine to eleven percent, I think, has been ingrained in people. And of course, you know, as business owners and as service providers, you know, we all want to be perfect. But you know, in reality, it is it's 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 fruitless i mean everybody knows that not i can't deliver 100 percent satisfaction on every single interaction right um and so you know even go, you know going back to this notion that um you know even as humans we can't sniff out fake reviews mm -hmm. when we see five stars across the board i i think we can all pretty well discern that yeah there's there's something fishy going on here yeah well, Tom, I thank you so much for joining us to ask your question. And you asked some good follow-up questions. This is great. Lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky us for having you on here. Thank you, Kiki and Ben. Always good to yeah. be here. All right. Thank you. So and, and just wanted to chase this, this thing uh, here about uh, bad reviews, uh, helping you know the pulse of your customer and, and helps the customer evolve. This is uh, Hassana's point. Yeah. Um, yeah, like one of some of the research that we've seen um, is that when people see a negative review, it actually increases their curio curiosity about that company. Um, so, like if I'm seeing five stars across the board, I might say, "Oh, there's something wrong here." I see that there. Are, when I see a negative review or a mixed review, that that increases my curiosity and makes me want to discover more about that company. Me and too. This is coming from the research that we've read. Yeah, it's so crazy. I mean, I actually, I do. I look for some of those negative reviews. And if there's something like a uh, great product, but the the shipping took longer than expected or something like that, I'm like, oh, they're real. You know, like they're, <laughs> they're not just going to disappear and I'll have a, a horrible product. So, you know, and it's funny because Gav said, Gav, and I said, Gav, Gavin, we're such good friends. Uh, yeah. Like my internet provider, not getting five stars today from me. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. So, hey, Ben, um, I wanted to talk with you a little bit more digging into sort of the way that uh, organizations, businesses, associations, we work with associations a lot, the way that they can explore this particular topic that we have today, in-person real-time reviews, what can, what are some takeaways? What are some things that somebody who's listening and they're saying, okay, um, what can I take from what I've heard today and apply to my business, my association, my organization, so that we can maybe explore this and make things better in the future? 
Yeah. Well, I would say for you know anybody who's trying to manage the review lifecycle, understanding the psychology behind how people give reviews um, mm -hmm. is kind of the point of today's review chat. Um, you know, Gavin's company specializes in helping companies to gather reviews at a point in time at which number one, they're inclined to just give a review in general. Because when I'm at the store, if I'm in the restaurant, if I'm in the office completing my dental appointment, that's the point at which I am inclined to give you a review because I'm there in the moment right then. Um, the other, so that Gavin already said that uh, they're seeing an increase in reviews given of 400 to 500% if you can capture the review in the moment. Right. The other thing uh, to, to kind of talk about the psychology and the sociology behind giving reviews is that when you ask for the review in the moment, the reviews that you receive are likely to be more positive than the ones that are received if you do it kind of asynchronously, right? If I ask you in a follow-up survey a day, two later, or maybe a week later. So knowing that when people give reviews in the moment, not only are they more likely to give a review, but they're also more likely to give a positive review can be helpful for business owners. You know, one of the issues I'd like to explore down the road is like, so to what extent are we manipulating the review process mm -hmm. in such a way that these reviews are no longer reviews, they're more testimonial. Like gaming the system to the point where I'm I'm artificially inflating the number of positive reviews that, right. I, that I'm getting. And is so, and is that such a is that such a bad thing? I, so, I, these are some of the kind of the hairy issues that I want to explore down the road. No, I was thinking about that earlier when we were talking about, well, you know, you're going to have a larger percentage of positive reviews if you're right there in the moment, asking the person in face to face. And I was having the same sort of thing. I was thinking, okay, so as a speaker, what does that mean? So if I'm Ooh. a speaker and I'm asking the person, cause I do that sometimes and I'll go like, well, tell me, what did you think? You know, and, and anybody knows that the person's not going to say, well, you were just really uh, terrible, you know, um, yeah. unless they hate you or, and even then they probably will still say it was okay. You know, it's some stuff I knew. And then later, they're going to be like, I hate Kiki Latalian. But, um, but you know, I think that it is interesting because do you really want, are you looking for testimonials or are you looking for the truth or are you looking for both? Maybe you're looking for both and maybe capturing the, in the moment, in their faces, you're getting an, you're getting what really happened that they can remember for one thing. So you're getting accuracy on that front because they don't always remember everything perfectly later. Yep. But maybe you try to get reviews in a number of different ways or a number of different formats. But mm. then, do you then get review fatigue? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there's, there's definitely a notion of, of review fatigue. Um, you know, the best the best time to get those reviews is is in the moment when they're voluntary. Um, you know, the, not only is it leading to to a better conversion rate and actually getting the reviews. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're you're getting positive reviews too. I I think Gavin's point here uh, is that he's he lets edit uh, customers edit the review after they've been given in person. That's beautiful. Good. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, good. Being able to, to give a review right there in person, and then um, you know if I felt any kind of social pressure that oh I had to give a positive review because the business owner was standing right there, um, now I can go back and edit it. Um, so yeah, that's that's a that's a very astute way of a wise way of handling those reviews. Yeah. I love the fact that you can go back and if you've ever given a review that's positive and then you have a really horrible experience, boy, trying to go back and uh, make sure that you revise or update that review. That's painful to know that somewhere out there I'm saying something positive about, Oh, say a dentist that uh, later I'm like, Oh no, 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 no. Don't, don't go there. And I actually had to do that. I had to request that a site take that review down because I had had a not so positive experience following that. So a four letter word experience, <laughs> a four letter word experience. Well, I have to say, you know, uh, Gavin, uh, I think we're going to have to have you back sometime, um, sometime when you're not having storms in Ireland and, and you're not, <laughs> <laughs> and you have a better connection because there are so many other questions that we have and we surely enjoyed the time that you were 
here with us. And so uh, I, what do you think, Ben? I think that that's something we're Absolutely. definitely going to have to do. And yeah, I want to we'll thank, I want to thank you, Ben, for, for of course being on the show today and answering more of our questions about reviews, online reviews, in-person reviews. And for everyone who's watching, um, this is something that we're exploring and we're growing and we want to get the word out and we want to hear from you what you would like to hear or learn about on Review Chat. You know, if people want to uh, find out more about Review Chat, you can always go. Um, we're on Facebook. There's a Facebook page. You can also uh, check out our little call to action to join the Review Society because all the information about upcoming Review Chats you can find as a member of the Review Society. Membership is free right now, so you should go and join. And I want to thank Thank you all for listening to this episode. It's your only live show and podcast dedicated to the art and science of customer reviews. You can always catch new episodes uh, on the of this chat, of this particular chat, review chat, on the second Thursday of every month. And we actually have a really cool episode, that a really cool show that's brewing up for next month. And Ben, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, so I, I came across a press release recently uh, from the Specialty Sleep Association. Uh, mm -hmm. and especially, Specialty Spe uh, Sleep Association had their big convention, I think it was this week or last week. Uh, in any case, they held uh, during their convention about online reviews and how they affect the buying decision for mattresses. Um, late last year, uh, I posted to Facebook a very uh, incendiary article, I would say, around um, review sites for mattresses and how kickbacks to these people who are writing reviews yes. about mattresses affect your buying decision uh, when you're going out to, to purchase a new mattress. Um, and so when I saw especially Sleep Association was going to be holding a panel discussion about this, not only was I driven to, uh, drawn to it because uh, it has something to do with reviews, but all of this is an association, which is my other passion. <laughs> um, and so I thought it would be invite on some of the uh, panelists and leadership from the Specialty Sleep Association to talk about the outcomes um, of their panel discussion. Uh, so this will be a, an interesting kind of consumer-oriented um, review chat. But at the same time, I think there'll be a lot of take-homes for uh, the, B2, uh, the B2B market uh, because I think we can, start, we can draw some interesting parallels between major purchases for yeah. consumers and yeah. how major purchases in businesses also go down. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and and if I remember the article that you're referencing, I mean, there are people who their entire, like their the whole way that they make money, that they, they make a living writing these reviews. It's ridiculous. So yeah, some um, of them are multimillionaires. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not just ridiculous, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And I also question like, my my path in life because I'm definitely not a millionaire and I'm doing a lot more work than writing false reviews for mattress for mattresses. So, all right, with that, I hope that uh, you guys will join us uh, for the next, the second Thursday next month. Uh, I think yes. it's March 8th. It's the same, it is March. right? It's the 8th. Uh, and we're going to explore that topic. So you need to check it out. You need to join the Review Society online for more information. Click that little Review green Society button if you can. Always. It's, yep. review, it's reviewsociety.org if you're listening to this later. And thanks, thanks to everyone for listening. All right. So long. So long, Gavin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judd. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye, guys. Have a great week. Or so a great long. rest of the week. <laughs>